Writing an operating system is an iterative process. The more you work on your operating system, the more you learn, and as you gain more experience, you find better ways of doing things. In part 4, we started using C with the 16-bit OpenWatcom compiler. At that point, we didn't know enough about protected mode, which is why we decided to take this approach. However, there are many disadvantages. Real mode is deprecated, so no modern compiler supports it anymore. Because of that, we have to resort to these old, deprecated and inferior compilers like Watcom. Yeah, let's be honest here, Watcom isn't what it used to be in the 90s. And I'm speaking from experience having encountered some bugs myself. Debugging compiler issues is the last thing we want to do. We already have enough problems with our own code. Of course, that doesn't mean that we may never encounter any issues in GCC. However, since GCC is used by so many people, the chance of us encountering a bug for the first time is actually pretty small. Also, GCC is used by some pretty major projects, including Linux, which gives me a lot more confidence in GCC as compared to Botcom. The second disadvantage is that having two different compilers in our build is pretty annoying to deal with. Some compiler specific things like specifying call conventions or telling the compiler how to use padding or not to use padding. These things are done differently in GCC and Watcom. Not to mention having to deal with near, far and linear pointers all in the same code. This makes it much more difficult to share code between modules. So why not just avoid having this issue altogether? The third disadvantage is that real mode doesn't let us access memory above 1 megabyte. Considering that some of the lower memory is already occupied, the largest contiguous area that we can use is around 500 kilobytes. That is very little memory actually, and our kernel may grow beyond that. What this means is that in order to be able to load our kernel fully into memory, we have to switch to protected mode anyway, so why not just do this earlier? Taking all of these reasons into consideration, let's do things a bit differently. Instead of writing 16-bit code, we will switch to 32-bit protected mode and then write 32-bit protected mode code in C using the GCC compiler. The biggest challenge here will be calling the BIOS interrupts, which is something that we cannot do from protected mode. There are several ways of addressing this issue. But the simplest solution is to simply switch back to real mode, call the BIOS interrupt, and then go back to protected mode. I showed how this can be done in the protected mode video, you can find the link in the description. There are some disadvantages to using this approach, um, like losing all the protection features offered by protected mode, or the bad performance. However, since we are working in the stage 2 bootloader, this solution is actually good enough. If we were in the kernel, yeah, this would be a bad idea. But since we are in the bootloader, this is fine. A little side note here. If you've been following my channel, I've already done two live streams where I implemented all the code that you will see today and also explained it line by line. Because of that, there's no point in doing this again in this video. So my main goal is to only explain the most important parts. Let's start by talking about the build process, which had some significant changes. I started with this config.make file, which, where I put a lot of variables that were spread all over the place. So here I define variables for all the tools that we use, like CC, which is the C compiler, CXX, which is the C++ compiler, the linker, and so on, as well as linker flags or compiler flags and so on. Since we are targeting two systems, one of them being the host machine and the other one being the uh, freestanding operating system environment, I have created these target variables as well, which are used for the freestanding environment. I also added these binutils and GCC version and URL, which we are using right here. And this is another thing that I did, which was to automate the process of building our toolchain. I've already covered how to set up your machine in a separate video, 
I'm aware that this is not something very difficult to do, but since there are a lot of young people that may benefit from watching this, I will explain a bit how this works. So the basic approach when automating a process like this is to break it down into logical steps and then seeing how each step can be implemented through the command line. In our case, the basic steps are to first download the archive, unpack it, create the folder structure that we want, and then do any preparation steps that we need, like running the configure command, and finally run the build itself. The steps are very similar for both binutils and GCC, and this is a pretty standard process of compiling things on Linux. Let's start with the beginning. The first step on our list would be to download binutils and GCC. So let's start with binutils. If you look for this package in a browser, you may end up on this download page, where you can download whatever version of binutils you want. Instead of downloading, what I'm going to do is right-click and select copy link address. And I will paste this link in our little script. Looking at this URL, we can see that the version is part of the URL. So let's replace the version with a variable that we can set somewhere at the beginning of the script. To actually download the file, we need to run a program like wget, which knows how to download files from the web. Next, we want to extract this file we just downloaded. Since this is a tar.gz archive, tar is the tool that we need. The flags x means extract and f is used to specify the archive file name. At this point, we want to create a binutils build folder where the files generated by the build will be stored. This is called an out of source build since we are performing the build outside the folder where the source code is located. Next, we go into this binutils build folder and run the configure script relative to this folder. This way, the makefile and all the required resources for the build will be generated inside our build directory and not in the source directory. We need to tell the configure script what the prefix directory is, which means the place where binutils will be installed, the target, which means the platform for which we want our toolchain to build for, uh, with sysroot is an option that will allow us to build user land programs for our operating system, disable NLS, disables localization for error messages, and disable werror allows the build to continue if we get warnings. We should declare the variables we introduced for the prefix and target. Next, let's run the build commands, which are make and make install. The dash j4 argument tells make to run the build in parallel, which will significantly reduce how much time it takes. And dash c will tell make the directory where we want to perform the build. That's basically it. All it takes to automate this process. You can put these commands in a shell script and you will get your build tools. However, we are engineers here, so let's integrate this into a make file. For starters, we can add a phony rule called toolchain binutils that contains all of these commands that we just wrote. The variable declarations need to be moved outside the rule. And now let's break this process down in two parts. Downloading the source and doing the actual build. The way we do this is to create a rule for the binutils tar gz archive and having our main rule depend on this archive file. The advantage of this approach is that we can now take advantage of makes parallelism features. We can download GCC at the same time that we are building binutils. In addition to the save time, make can decide whether it needs to download the file or not. If it's already downloaded, it will not download it again, saving us more time. We can break the script down even further, like unpacking in a separate rule, but I decided to leave it as it is. In the final version, I set the prefix path to the toolchain target directory and I put everything in the toolchain directory. The process for building GCC is very similar to this, except for some of the build commands which are a bit different. Something to note here is that the toolchain GCC target depends on the toolchain binutils. This will enforce the correct build order. And here is the final code that we wrote in the live streams. Here I added the prefix bin directory to the path variable. This way the compiler executables can be run without having to specify the full path. This toolchain rule depends on toolchain binutils and toolchain GCC and it allows us to write make toolchain to build everything at once. Now something I haven't done very well here is that toolchain binutils is a phony rule. It's not a real file. And because of that, when we call make toolchain, these steps will be executed every time, even though the toolchain is already built. 
something we could do to fix this would be to split this rule even further and have toolchains bin utils depend on one of the files that gets built, like, I don't know, the GCC executable, for example. And then have the GCC executable contain all of these rules here. Finally, we have these clean toolchain rules, which just delete everything. Another place that had significant changes was the stage 2 make file. Here I replaced all the old variables with the new ones from config.make and replaced every use of Watcom with GCC. The way we are running the stage 2 make file, we are in a separate instance of the make process. This is why I declared all the variables using export, so they are visible in child processes as well. This also means that any modification we do to these variables will stay in the current process and will not affect the other modules that we build. This is why I'm appending to these variables instead of creating new ones. For the assembly flags, I set the output format to elf, so that we can link these together with the C object files in a single stage 2 binary. For the C flags, I added F freestanding and no std lib. A mistake I see a lot is adding like a dozen flags, disabling all sorts of stuff. If you have built your toolchain for the correct target architecture, the only flags you need are these two, which will tell GCC that we want to build something that doesn't depend on an operating system and doesn't use the standard library. GCC knows what other things it needs to disable. Check this article from the OS Dev Wiki for more details, link in the description. If you are building for another architecture like 64-bit or ARM, then you might need to add other flags. Check the article for more details. For the target libs, I appended the GCC library. What exactly is this GCC library and why are we linking against it? libgcc is a static library that is bundled with the GCC compiler. You may have seen it in the GCC build process. It contains some very useful things that the compiler depends on. For example, 64-bit divisions, exception handling, and other very low-level things that our target CPU doesn't support natively. Because we built it for the i686-elf target, it doesn't depend on any operating system features, so it can be used in a freestanding environment. If we don't link it, we will get many linker errors whenever we encounter one such case. GCC will generate calls to this library automatically when necessary. Implementing these functions ourselves is very difficult and easy to get wrong, so it's generally a bad idea. Here's an example of what the 64-bit division looks like. You really don't want to do this yourself. We've actually encountered this type of errors when working with Wattcom, which didn't come with a freestanding library that we could use. Here's an example of a function we had to implement, which performs a 32-bit multiplication. Of course, from now on we no longer need it, so we can delete it. Since I talked about libgcc, I'd also like to briefly talk about the C standard library. We are in a freestanding environment. This means we don't have access to the C standard library, which heavily depends on the host operating system. However, there are a number of headers that we can use in our own operating system. These include stddef.h, stdarg.h, stdbool.h, stdint.h and many others. So, this means that we can use things like the standard numerical types, VA list, and all the things defined in those headers without having to do this ourselves. After building the toolchain, we can find all of these freestanding headers in the prefix directory, lib, gcc, gcc version, include. This include directory is added automatically by gcc, you don't need to add it manually to the build, however, you might want to add it to your IDE configuration. The rest of the build process isn't super complicated. Uh, what I did was simply to change variables from LD16 to target LD and so on. Just changing the syntax of how we call these, these programs. Next, let's talk a bit about the linker script. So what we had before is uh, this linker script, which looked like this, and now it looks like this. The syntax is obviously a bit different, but we are essentially doing the same thing. So we're setting the output format to binary, same in the new script, no default lib is set as a compiler flag now. The starting point is the entry symbol, same in the new script. One difference is that we will move everything to offset 500, I will explain why a bit later. The other options aren't that important, so let's move on to the sections. First we have the entry section which contains our entry point. The text section contains the rest of the code, data contains initialized global variables, 
RO data contains only the constants or read-only data, and BSS contains the uninitialized global variables, and we have to mem set this area to zero when starting. LD also allows us to declare symbols in the linker script. This is what these underscore underscore variables are. The period is a special symbol that signifies the current offset in the output file. We can assign values to it, like we are doing here on the first line to set the offset to 500, and we can assign other variables to have its value like we are doing with these underscore underscore symbols. The cool part is that we can access these symbols from our code. So we can figure out what the size of each region is, we will use these to determine the size of our kernel or the location and size of the BSS section. Next let's look at some of the code changes starting with entry.asm. Before giving control to the C code we have to switch to protected mode. I have another video where I cover this process in detail, here are all the steps. Enabling the A20 gate, loading the global descriptor table, setting the protection enable flag in control register 0, doing the far jump to protected mode and then setting up the segment registers. The next thing we have to do is clear the BSS section, which contains uninitialized global variables. These have to be set to zero. As you can see, I used the BSS start and end symbols declared in the linker script to determine where the BSS section is after declaring them as extern. To mem set everything to zero, I used the wrap stowsb structure. Stowsb stands for store string byte, and this instruction stores the byte from AL into the memory referenced by the EDI register, and then increments EDI. Rep repeats this instruction ECX times. Finally, I push the boot drive number, which is passed to us by the BIOS, through the DL register. This way, it is passed as a parameter to the start function, which is written in C. Another file which had major changes is x86.asm. This is where our BIOS interrupt calls are. Before, we just wrote some wrapper functions that would pass the parameters from C. Now this becomes a little bit more complicated because we are in protected mode. To simplify this process, I created two macros, enter real mode and enter protected mode, which perform the processor mode switch. I covered this as well in my video about protected mode. The steps to go back to real mode are to jump to a 16-bit protected mode segment that we have already set up in our global descriptor table, then disable the protected mode bit from control register 0, jump to real mode, set the real mode segment registers and finally enable interrupts. To get back to protected mode, the A20 gate and the global descriptor table don't need to be set up again, so we only have to do the other steps. I also implemented this linear to segment offset macro which converts a memory address from the linear format used by 32-bit protected mode to a segment offset address used in real mode. The way this works is that we divide the address by 16 and take that as the segment, and we use the remainder of that division as the offset. This macro takes four arguments, first is the address that we want to convert, second is the segment register where we want to store the output segment, the fourth argument is the register where we want to store the offset, and the third argument is the 32-bit version of that register. For example, if we want to convert address 1234 and store it in the SSI, we call linear to seg offset 1234, comma, uh, DS, ESI, and then SI. Now let's see how we need to modify these wrapper functions. I will demonstrate using the discrete function, the other ones will be pretty similar. The function will be called from C, what that means is that we are in 32-bit protected mode, so the first change is to mark this as 32-bit. And change. So the first changes are to mark this as 32-bit and change the registers involved in setting up the stack frame to their 32-bit counterparts. Then we can call the enter real mode macro. And now we are in 16-bit real mode. Next we will have to change how we obtain the function arguments, because now every argument is aligned to a multiple of 4 instead of 2, so instead of bp plus 4 we will use bp plus 8. For the pointer arguments we have to use the linear to segment offset macro to convert them to real mode pointers before we can access that memory. Something to keep in mind when calling this discrete function is that all the pointers we will pass will have to stay in lower memory that can be accessed from real mode, otherwise they will not work properly. The return value will be stored in EAX instead of AX, so that's another thing to change. 
Just before returning, we will perform the switch back to protected mode and restore the call frame using the 32-bit registers. EAX is destroyed during the switch, so we can save it by pushing it to the stack and then popping it. Before we move on, I wanted to explain why we need to be in segment 0. And the reason for that is the labels in this file. If we put our stage 2 in another segment, that means that these labels will now need to have two offsets attached to them. One for 32-bit and one for 16-bit. For example, let's say that we put our code at the old address 0x20000, so 20,000. In real mode, that would mean segment 2000 and offset 0 in hexadecimal. But in protected mode, we are using a linear memory model, so we only have an offset which would be 20,000 hexadecimal. That would make dealing with these switches from real to protected mode much more difficult to deal with. You would have to put 32-bit code in a different section than 16-bit code, be really careful how we define each label so it's in the correct section, modifying the linker script to have these extra sections. Keeping things in segment 0 is the easiest solution right now. Now let's move on to stdio.c where there are some more important changes. The first major change here is how we print characters to the screen. We could still use the BIOS interrupt, just like we are doing to the disk functions, but there's a faster and more efficient way of doing things. By using this more efficient method, we will be able to reuse this implementation in the kernel as well. The BIOS has configured the video card so it's in an 80 by 25 character, 16 color text mode. And the memory region starting from A0000 is directly mapped to the video card. For this particular mode, the characters are stored starting from the address B8000. So we can directly manipulate the characters on the screen by writing to this memory region. For each character that you see on the screen, there are two bytes. The first one is the character and the second one is the color. This is how the put char and put color functions work. Of course, we also want to be able to manipulate the hardware cursor position. The way we do this is by sending a message to the VGA controller chip. This is done using the outb CPU instruction that I have wrapped in the x86 outb function. There's not much to explain here. If you want to change the cursor, just copy the code you see here. Don't think too much about it. When we will do graphics, we will not do VGA programming, but we will use the VESA BIOS instructions. Because of that, there's not much reason to learn about VGA programming unless you want to implement drivers for Intel and Nvidia GPUs yourself which is something pretty difficult to do, but I mean, if you really want to, good luck. To clear the screen, all we have to do is go through the entire 80 by 25 character grid and set each one to null and the color to whatever default color we want to use. Finally, we reset the cursor position to 00. zero. For scrolling, we just have to copy all the characters from the rows below and finally, we clear the last line or lines. The putc method prints a character to the screen and moves the cursor to the next position. Here we also handle special characters like new line, tab and carry return. We also check if the current line is full and we need to go to a new line. And we also handle scrolling. Finally, we also move the hardware cursor. Since moving the hardware cursor involves output ports, I recommend you do this as rarely as possible as it might have quite a performance impact. The other function which had some significant changes was printf. Since now we have VA list, I used that instead of hacking the stack like we did before. The advantage of using VA list is that it will work properly with any call convention, so printf doesn't have to use cdecl anymore. It can use whatever the compiler decides. I also refactored the code a little bit, but let's move on. This is not that interesting. Finally, let's discuss about the kernel. And let's start with the kernel loading part from stage 2. I started by declaring these two pointers. The first is the kernel load buffer. This is some memory I reserved as a temporary buffer where I load pieces of the kernel binary and then kernel is where the final location will be. These two constants are defined in memdefs.h. This file contains the simplest implementation of memory management that you can do, which is to just manage it manually using constants. I already reserved some memory for the FAT driver and now I have reserved another section for loading the kernel. I also declared the area where the kernel will be finally placed, which is at the address 100,000 hexadecimal or 1 megabyte. This is a pretty good spot since it's an area that's not 
typically reserved for anything and we have plenty of space to expand. Ideally, we will want to decide where to place the kernel based on the results of the memory detection, but we will do that in another video. The loading procedure is pretty simple. We just open the kernel using the FAT driver we wrote, we read it block by block into memory and copy each block to the final location. After we are finished, we close the file and finally execute the kernel. This part is actually pretty interesting. The kernel start data type is a typedef for a void function and we are simply casting the kernel start address to a function and then calling this function. What's interesting is that we can define this function however we want and pass information from the bootloader to the kernel. This will be very useful when doing graphics since we need to pass information about the video modes which can only be changed from real mode or when we do memory management since the memory map is also obtained in real mode. Also, another interesting thing is that this kernel start function is written in C. And here it is. I simply asked the GCC compiler to place this function in the entry section. And in the linker script, we put this entry section right at the beginning of the binary. Next, I cleared the BSS section using memset. And that's basically everything we need to get C up and running. I would also like to highlight here the syntax I used to declare BSS start and end symbols. Notice that these aren't pointers that contain an address. This is the mistake that I actually made when trying this. These are not pointers, these are actually symbols. And the data type doesn't really matter, they can be anything. But uint8 just makes calculating the length easier when calling memset. All the other files in the kernel are simply copied from stage 2 except for x86.sm where I removed everything except for the out B and in B functions. Also, in the linker script, I changed the address from 500 to 100,000, which is the address where we load the kernel. And with this, I think I explained all the important changes I made during the live streams. If you want to learn more and see how I wrote everything line by line, go ahead and watch those live streams. In the next video, we'll talk about the fresh subject, interrupts. But until then, thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this video interesting and you learned something. So thank you very much and see you next time. Bye bye and happy new year. Bye.